welcome, Dr. Leakey. And Thank you. Look forward to the time that we have together. Thank you very much. And welcome to West Michigan. We're pleased to have you here and, and are thankful that you've been able to come during this time of the year when it's not quite its most beautiful, but uh, it has its own, own beauty during this particular Thank time. You. I've got some questions here that are, I hope, uh, enlightening for the people who are watching this program and also call upon your expertise and your experiences, uh, a lifelong commitment to conservation and, and understanding human origins. And so we're going to talk about some questions that guide through your lifetime, uh, take you back a little bit, and I hope that um, they will be questions that will be enlightening to, to all of us. So we know that your parents were a remarkable influence in your life, uh, namely in your interest in paleoanthropology. And I'm wondering, what were some of the other ways that they influenced you? I think in many ways, um, we were not a very close family. We stayed together. We were a very loyal family, but we were not particularly close. And I, I, The lasting lesson I think I had was to be independent, uh, to chart one's own course, uh, not to blame anyone if you make the wrong decision and to work on the consequences of any decision you make, be it good or bad, to improve your, 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 your lot in life. And so I, I tend to be a decisive person. Um, I take opportunities that present themselves. Um, and I think many of, my, many of my friends who always complain that I've been super lucky uh, see, see opportunities, but they let them go by before they wish they'd mm -hmm. jumped onto them. Mm -hmm. I tend to jump onto them first. If I don't like them, I jump off. Okay. <laughs> so really, the, the question of boundaries were not part of your, your growing up? Not at all, no. I grew up uh, thinking of myself as, a, as, a, as an individual, a citizen of, of the world, really, with um, a, a very clear vision that, that humanity had, had come from a, a scientific explanation and that our future depended on our ability to use science to take us forward. Talk a little bit about your life growing up in Kenya and what that did for your understanding of the natural world and your comfort in it or ex you know, reason to explore it. Did that contribute? Well, my parents spent a lot of the time when we were children mm -hmm. in faraway places where there were no, they didn't have um, access to good, good vehicles. They mm -hmm. tended to have very broken down vehicles, very simple tentage. But we would go off and spend three or four weeks in a particular area where they would be looking for fossils. And I grew up really as a, as a neighbor of nature, um, where one was constantly aware that around one there were, there were other creatures, including dangerous ones, mm -hmm. but very beautiful ones. Mm -hmm. And I just learned to fit in and, and learn to um, really find one's, one's amusement, one's entertainment, one's um, feed one's curiosity by looking around one in a natural environment and, and not dependent on what many young today are mm. with um, television and videos and, and computer games and cell phones and heaven knows what else they're using these days. But we had none of that at all. We didn't even have a radio or a gramophone when mm. I was a child. Okay, so it tends to put you right in the front of it all. I'm curious in terms of um, what you mentioned in the recent Bones of Turkana documentary. And you mentioned that initially you were uninterested in following your parents' footsteps in, in um, paleoanthropology. Was there a specific moment or experience that changed your mind? No, I think largely growing up and being aware that one had a very famous set of parents, we got a lot of public attention being aware, at least in my father's case, that he had a very good education. Um, I suppose that many young, young people, particularly young men in those days, felt that it would be very hard to grow in the shadow. Um, mm. And as I had dropped out of high school, um, there were very few options that I had, but I didn't want to try and grow under the shadow. Uh, looking back on it now, it was rather stupid. <laughs> and, and if I was looking for a challenge, uh, growing in a shadow would be far more challenging than trying to grow in the sunshine. Um, <laughs> but that's retrospective now. But 
Yes, I didn't want to be constantly referred to as Lewis and Mary Leakey's son. Mm -hmm. I always sought to be known as the them over my parents rather than I was their son. <laughs> it's taken a long time to get there. <laughs> <laughs> sounds, sounds like an important task uh, to conduct. What were the some, uh, some of the other ways that you felt you developed your commitment to conservation? So there's one thing about enjoying the natural world, but how did you determine that you were going to step into that pathway? Well, I'm not sure I ever made that decision. Um, mm -hmm. My life has never been uh, organized in such a clear-cut way. I knew about wildlife. I knew about, by then I knew about fossils. Um, I was aware of the national parks, which were, we were a very young country. Mm -hmm. And I was aware um, that things weren't all going very well for nature in our country. And I was, I was puzzled by the fact that the obvious solution to many of the problems wasn't being taken by anybody. It was, everyone was just whinging and complaining and talking about how awful it was. Mm -hmm. We're losing this, we're losing that. The government was being accused of not doing its job, but nobody seemed to be taking it seriously. And so somebody said, well, why don't you say something? Why don't you yourself do something? Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, why not? Mm -hmm. um, I'd been interested in elephants, largely in terms of their anatomy, because I we were working mm -hmm. with fossil elephants. And so modern elephants, to me, was just walking skeletons. Okay. Um, of great interest. Okay. Um, but I suppose I had a fairly high profile and, and when I eventually did uh, look into it and spoke very loudly, um, mm -hmm. to my utter surprise, people said, oh, yes, we should do something. Mm -hmm. And then the president of Kenya um, said, well, you're making such, such a lot of noise against what we're doing. Why don't you do it? And, and we'll make a lot of noise about your failures. So <laughs> it seems a good way to deal with a, a rebel. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and so I took up the challenge and, and accepted to become the, the founder director of the Kenya Wildlife Service, but on condition that he, he let me do it. And of course, mm -hmm. at that time, the so-called conservation community were appalled that mm -hmm. somebody who had never had any training and any credentials in conservation, I was just looking at extinct animals as fossils, mm -hmm. should suddenly be given the task of organizing our wildlife protection. And, and people said, you know, the country's gone completely mad. Hmm. Um, I think I thought so too. But it was a tremendous <laughs> opportunity, and Absolutely. we had a huge challenge, um, which was fun to take on. Mm -hmm. We've seen a, a growth in, or not growth, but many different approaches that have been taken to conservation, particularly in the idea of, of national parks and, and protecting the kinds of resources that we find in those parks. What are some of the successful strategies that you feel you have seen in, in moving conservation forward? Well, first I'd like to say that I, I don't think one solution in one country that's worked mm -hmm. is necessarily um, easily applicable to another country. Um, there are many circumstances, uh, the vagaries of weather, mm -hmm. um, the vagaries of, of, of um, political aspects, land ownership, uh, climate change in the present mm -hmm. context. Um, so I think one needs to be very careful about offering a solution to anything that is, that is generalized. Mm -hmm. um, I think the greatest mistake retrospectively, and I'm not sure that it's helpful to make this comment, but I think it may be the basis mm -hmm. of future consideration of mitigating uh, approaches, is that looking at the fossil record of the last 20, 30 million years, there have been periods of massive climate change that we can represent in, in the geological rocks. And whenever climate has changed dramatically, the first communities of, of, of natural organisms that become extinct are those that live on islands. Okay. And extinction on islands always comes before mass extinction on the land. And thinking about it logically, our national parks have become terrestrial islands. They're not um, <coughs> floating in the sea, but they're surrounded by human development that essentially have the same effect as the sea in that nothing can leave and nothing can come in. And we have created a genetic watertight island. Mm. And climate change is happening. 
some areas are getting warmer, drier, others are getting wetter and colder. And many of these national parks will probably not be able to sustain the communities of, of species within them mm -hmm. forever. Mm -hmm. There's no way for them to migrate to because they have to go through cities and farmland. Mm. There's no way we can take them to and there's no way we can stop the changes. And, and we may have in our best effort to save biodiversity, put it in bottles that are sealed with poison and we may lose most of our biodiversity because of our own stupidity, hmm. which would be a sad story, mm -hmm. but I think a very real story. Now, what can we do about it? Mm -hmm. Clearly, there is an approach today to opening up corridors between certain ecological areas, uh, putting in much stricter control over land use uh, zoning, mm -hmm. um, perhaps acquiring land that will enable wild species to migrate to other areas should the need arise. I think a big effort's going into um, captive captive breeding of endangered species that could perhaps be reintroduced mm -hmm. at another time, either in the same area where they're endemic to or in another area that could be in the future made available to them. So I don't think all is lost, mm -hmm. but I think we will lose more if we don't wake up to the fact that we've made a bad mistake. Okay. There, there has been some you know, really interesting developments, I think, in terms of what we know about biodiversity and, and how um, adaptation occurs. I'm wondering if you could talk to us a little bit more about what you've called the sixth extinction, and you were talking about it two decades ago, um, and really identify for us perhaps some of the frontiers of knowledge that we need to explore in order to accomplish the kind of goals that you're talking about in preserving biodiversity. You know, it's a huge and complicated story, and I would hate to suggest that I can do justice mm -hmm. to it in a short interview of this kind, but the rate at which species are being lost today, I think is a species of some kind that is unique every 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And the numbers now of, of, of species is, is, is so, are so dramatic that the realistic possibility exists that we could in the next decade, maybe two decades, lose more than 60, if not 70 percent of, of life as we know it today. Hmm. This has happened before, but it's not just that they're lost, but all of these living entities are part of food chains, they're part of very complex webs. And if you take if some out because they failure to adapt, their disappearance will cause others to drop out. And we are creating a, a catastrophic situation. And in the past when this has happened, the, the five previous eras of mass extinction, once you reach a certain level, the whole thing just falls in on itself and collapses. Mm -hmm. And we are, I think, very arrogant to believe that extinction is for everything but us. It, it is inescapable that the process of extinction will include us at some point. Mm -hmm. When? How? I don't know. We like to think that evolution is, is, is an option. Go and talk to the pathogens and, and the bacteria that are causing um, resistant uh, TB, mm -hmm. uh, infectious diseases that can no longer be treated with antibiotics. We have created environments where in a, in a relatively rapid generation turnover in microorganisms, new forms or species have appeared that we can't keep up with. Mm -hmm. Now, we may have accelerated evolution in the microorganisms that will wipe out our crops, wipe out our domestic animals, wipe us out in, in large numbers. And so we need to understand evolution. We need to understand what's happened before and what may happen again. We cannot afford to lose the natural worlds at this moment in our understanding of life. Mm -hmm. Are you an optimist or a pessimist in, in all of this? In the short term, I'm, I'm very pessimistic. I think the, the crisis of, 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 of human existence <coughs> is bad enough. The, the level of poverty in developing mm -hmm. countries, in Africa particularly, um, South and Central America, in, in Asia, 
is such that it's very, very difficult to prioritize some of the things that need to be done other than bring up the lot of the mass. That is essential. But do we have time to do that and then the other, or should we be doing some of the other at the same time? And I would argue that if we can prioritize the welfare of the people, but not at the exclusion of the welfare of the planet, we may make progress. And I think there needs to be far more commitment by government mm. to cut out carbon dioxide emissions, mm. to cut out throwing some of the filth into the rivers and into the ocean, and to cut out some of the waste that we see in the way we live. Mm -hmm. That would help. Let's talk about government a little bit, because you have been an outspoken critic of the Kenyan government most recently in, in, I think it was February, you had a press conference to talk about needing to clean up the Kenyan Wildlife uh, Service. Could you talk a, a little bit about your expectations for leadership in government? What, you know, how can we as citizens move our government leaders forward? What expectations do we need? from those leaders? Well, I've, I've criticized government, but I also mm -hmm. worked at the top end of government mm -hmm. for some years. So I know what it's like to be criticized, and I know sometimes the criticism hurts, but is, is legitimate. Mm -hmm. my, my concern w recently was that the evidence was f there for everybody to see that we were losing species like rhinoceros and elephant at a, le at a rate that was unsustainable. Mm -hmm. Popular knowledge street gossip usually has some basis in fact and everybody was commenting on the fact that there was massive corruption and impunity in the organizations that basically control the security of wildlife and and the the protection of, of the species by closing off loopholes for export I merely raised the question of look it's, we don't need drones and we don't need a bigger army. We need some integrity and we need some honesty. Hmm. Those who are involved in, in, in illegitimate actions shouldn't be transferred to another job so they can do something else that's not good for the society. They should simply be fired. Hmm. And having fired them, they should be subjected to the proper legal process and if they're found to have, have broken the law, they should face the law in court and take the consequences of their actions. I'm not asking for extrajudicial treatment, but I am saying don't be afraid that acting on somebody who's broken wildlife law will be politically unpopular because the people of Kenya are no different from the people of America or Canada or, or anywhere else. They want to see their wildlife protected for future generations. And it needed doing, and so I, I was speaking out. And the greatest problem for, for conservation in many countries is this politically not such good taste for politicians who've got a short life. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they don't want to be accused of doing something for the creatures that can't speak out mm -hmm. when there are people that they should be doing something for that do speak out. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 it's complete rubbish to think that people don't care so what I'm saying is let the public, let the people be loud in their wishes for conservation. Mm -hmm. From a loud popular opinion, government takes courage, always. Mm -hmm. But if people are silent, government's not sure what that will do to the individuals making the decisions in terms of the next election. So acts of courage all around. Yes. <laughs> one, one question that... Um, I guess I'd like to step a little bit back to the biodiversity issue. Um, what have you learned about biodiversity and how we value it since you wrote your book? I think there's a greater realization that, mm -hmm. that biodiversity is an indicator of the state of the planet. Mm -hmm. I think we're beginning to realize the importance of water. We're beginning to realize the importance at a very broad level of um, carbon sinks and forests and natural vegetation. And I think we're beginning to realize the, the importance of looking after things that we always used to believe were inexhaustible. Okay. I think that has changed. I think the other thing that has changed 
is I think there is a growing awareness, it's still not very, very deep uh, or very informed, that the climate is changing and we almost certainly have a lot to do with what's gone wrong. Mm -hmm. And that it's going to affect us whether we live uh, in, in the state of Michigan, whether we live in the state of, of one of the states, China, or South America or Africa. Climate change is going to affect all of us in one way or the other. And I think that awareness is coming now. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the, the media in particular still like to make mileage from suggesting there's an argument, a controversy. Mm -hmm. But I think people are getting smart enough to realize that the media is simply trying to sell themselves and not necessarily help their, 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 their readership. And, you know, I would be very willing to, to ask editors and, and producers whether they've ever thought about the responsibilities that they hold in presenting programs that rubbish mm -hmm. scientific evidence. Yeah. I think the, the understanding of, of science is one that um, challenges some of our political decisions, that, that we don't take science fully into account. Um, have you seen that issue surface in some of the work that you've done? or? Um, well, to a certain extent. I mean, I think in the, in the Kenyan context, much mm -hmm. of our, our um, education uh, has been influenced heavily by Christian missionaries mm -hmm. um, and Islamic um, evangel evangelicals. It's a contradiction mm -hmm. of terms, mm -hmm. but it, it's spreading the word of Islam as well as spreading the word of, of, of Christianity. And I think some, some of the messages that are coming across aren't very sophisticated and, and are bringing up a, a population that thinks that science is an option. Uh, mm -hmm. You can take it or leave it and if you mm -hmm. don't like its message then you can raise your eyes and, and, and leave it to an, an almighty that will ultimately mm -hmm. be responsible for your mm -hmm. destiny. Uh, to do that today and to raise children today who believe that even if they fail the world will be looked after by the almighty, pretty short-sighted and I think pretty shallow. And I don't think there's any religion that says you shouldn't be educated and you shouldn't use the brain that you have for the good of your kind and mm -hmm. for the good of the planet. And mm -hmm. so I'm not sure where they're getting this short circuit from. Yeah. What about, um, let's, let's talk a little bit more about climate change and, and the idea that um, we know the climate is changing. Science has given us some clues about what may happen, but there is still great unknowns about what, um, how society will respond to some of these challenges. In this sort of new reality, what are some of the skills that we need to cultivate to be able to deal with some of that uncertainty that we face? Well, I think the first thing to do is, I mean, remember there is uncertainty, but the uncertainty is no longer about the science. The right. uncertainty is right. about the consequences. Exactly. Um, and the, if you measure the volume of the ice caps, mm -hmm. which can be done, mm -hmm. and you know what the cubic, cubic volume is of the ice caps, and you melt it, you know how much water is going to go in the ocean, uh, you know the volume of the ocean, and if you add that much that is not in the ocean at the moment, mm -hmm. it, it's like pouring a bucket of water into a bathtub that's already full, it's going to spill over the edge. Right. Now, spilling over the edge is simply going to raise the shoreline, mm -hmm. and many cities and, and places where people live are going to go into water. Mm -hmm. And, and while you may not want to believe it if you're living in Denver, mm -hmm. countries like, like uh, Bangladesh and, and many of the, the, the oceanic uh, countries and many of the ocean seaports stand a chance of being inundated and you can't live underwater. You can't grow crops in <laughs> salt water. Um, so they said, well, you know, that's up to the Bangladeshis and the Indians and the Africans and, and the poor people. But, you know, we're going to be fine here because we're not nowhere near the sea and it's not going to flood us. But what are you going to do about several billion refugees mm -hmm. who have nowhere to go, nothing to eat. Is your, your country um, with its Christian mm -hmm. ethics and its remarkable willingness to help others in need going mm -hmm. to turn your back on two billion people who are mostly uneducated and mostly don't believe in what things you believe in? You're just going to let them drown or you're going to take them in? And I think from all we see, you're going to take them in. This is going to affect everything. Mm -hmm. Um, how are we going to feed people? Mm -hmm. We, you can take a, a, a bell jar and you can, or a tent and you can grow wheat and you can artificially increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the air in which the wheat's growing. 
at a certain point, which is measurable and repeatable and testable, wheat stops producing grain that has the calorific value that it does today. And the cutoff point is about 460 parts per million. Hmm. We're almost at 400 parts per million today. It's projected that unless we change our carbon emissions, mm -hmm. we're going to be at 450, 460 in 30 to 50 years. That could take out 80% of the nutritional value of the grain crop around the world. Mm. So what are you going to do for your muffins and your, mm -hmm. your, 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 your food? <laughs> um, it's going to affect yes. you. Mm -hmm. Now, these are the things we've got to really, And we've got to, I think, come back to the fact that whether you're an African or Bangladeshi or an American or, or, or whatever you want to be, you're the same species. And what happens to this planet is going to happen to all of us. One way or the other, it's going to affect us. And we've got to stop thinking, I'm OK. Mm -hmm. Too bad that they live there, but that's their fault. Mm -hmm. It's not their fault. Mm -hmm. That's how the world is shaping. Let's talk about that uh, a little bit more in terms of, you know, do we need some new forms of government? Do we need a trans-international science advisory board? We, we've tested some of those ideas out through the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment in terms of gathering information, but do we need to think about new approaches towards governance? Is our international system capable of handling these kinds of questions? Well, you touched, you used two mm -hmm. words, governments and governance, mm -hmm. and they're very different. Mm -hmm. um, Governments are not necessarily to be relied on for governance mm -hmm. of, of good quality. I think the, the ideas that are, have been with us for the last several hundred years about democracy, um, representational government, the right of a citizen to be heard through representational uh, assembly, is something we've got to question anyway. Because with the, the, the lobby groups and with the money that's poured into election or the dishonesty that's used in election, you're not necessarily getting a group of men and women who will accurately reflect the wishes of the needs of the people in any country. And I simply am one of those who, who don't believe that democracy is, is, a, is, a, is a term that has much meaning anywhere in the world. It's, it's a chimera. And if you go back to its origin, of course, Democracy for, was for land-owning Greek white men, <laughs> not their wives, not their children, yeah. not their slaves, yeah. not their parents. <laughs> and that was fine, that sort of democracy, for those people who had it. Mm -hmm. We're not very different today. And I think we've got to think about governments in issues of governance. And there I think the interesting thing, I don't understand it, it's, it's, I'm the wrong generation, but the social, social media, and the, the, the way people can communicate around the world on big issues may produce a solution to some of the, the need for international commitment without it being politicized or ideologized, uh, as we've seen in the last several hundred years. And I am pretty sure that big ideas will probably sell better and be less subject to tweaking to suit um, the party in power if the people are really now given a voice and the majority of people are heard with a common theme that they want change. Mm -hmm. Then the role of the government is to affect that change in a fair and, and, and reasonable way. This I think will be a step forward. Whether it can be used to solve the immediate crisis of pumping more and more dirty things into the, into the environment, I don't know. Whether it'll be enough to tweak the conscience of corporations, not to sell the stuff they can't sell in country A, but sell it to country B because the environmental laws are different, I don't know. And I mean, I hate to say it, but Africa has become a dumping ground for technology and for chemis chemicals mm -hmm. that have long been outlawed in America and Europe. And yet these big corporations have big stocks of these chemicals and they send them to us. Now, in many cases, our leaders have to say, well, we've had nothing to solve this problem. Should we go on having nothing? Or should we take what we know isn't very good as a first step to helping our people? Mm -hmm. Tough, tough calls mm -hmm. to put on anybody, political or otherwise. Let's talk about the role of business. Um, they have they can be a force for good, they can be a force for bad. How do we push them 
um, as a force for good? I think increasingly business is a force for good. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly see the, the old-fashioned criticism of multinationals mm -hmm. as, as being quite out of place. And I think that, that clearly there are many corporations which are now showing a much greater responsibility in the way they do business, the way, where they collect their materials. And, and, and but I think that's come not necessarily voluntarily. Mm -hmm. It's become necessary because of market forces. And that's become apparent because of the social media. Mm -hmm. And I think we want to encourage that. I think we need to recognize that we can, business and corporations are part of human society. We can't do without them mm -hmm. any more than we can do without politicians at the moment or, or religious leaders. But we've got to work together much more than we have in the past. And I, I think it'll come. What worries me more is the influence these failed systems are having on developing countries mm -hmm. um, than they're having on their own. Because I think you have a much better educated, aware um, baseline to start from. Our people are still easily persuaded by good speakers that you know you can get blood out of a stone if you elect mm -hmm. somebody. Hmm. If we look at um, education, and, and we've talked a, a, a few moments about that, what are the kinds of things that you would want to see in our in our children's curriculum now that could help them appreciate um, the challenge before us in terms of biodiversity and conservation? Um, are we are we succeeding in that? Where, where else do we need to shore up some of that education? I think one of the important things to do globally, and it is globally, um, is persuade children that they're part of one species and that their, their individual identity is, is, is irrelevant to the bigger issue of humanity. And to try to uh, people understand that they can empathize and sympathize with people in China or in sub-Saharan Africa or in Southern America um, as if it was them themselves. That's one. Mm -hmm. Two, I think in the process of that we may be able to reduce amongst children a sense of them and us or prejudice based on largely on color but not entirely on color. And I think color prejudice is such a silly thing mm -hmm. um, given the fact that it's, it's no more than skin deep. Mm -hmm. and, um, genetically and, and historically and, and in all, res all respects. We know that the, the, the light color and the blue eyes are, are at most 12,000 years old. People were dark and dark eyes before that. It was the switch of the gene and, and everybody watching this program and, and, and anyone in the world has an African origin in the last 100,000 years. Mm -hmm. That's beyond doubt. Um, so why, why are we being so mean to our, our forefathers? <laughs> why don't we understand <laughs> that, you know, this is an unfortunate t to be pigmentally challenged. <laughs> but there it is. I mean, that's the way we come. But we should look below the skin mm -hmm. uh, and realize that our destiny really is up to us working together. There's an order. So I think if you can teach children that. Secondly, I think if you can, if, if you can persuade children that the resources of the planet are, are limited. And I would like to see a youth movement grow around the world uh, with uh, the media, social media, to try and persuade governments that in their governance, all trade in all wild species on the surface of the earth should be stopped. Mm. I think you may want to exclude uh, fisheries for the moment, because clearly we do need desperately some of the very large fish catches that are being made. But do we need budgery cars and parrots and, and mm -hmm. hamsters and, and th wild things that are in, put in cages and to decorate people? Think? I think the young should say, enough. Mm -hmm. We don't need these things. We can get dogs and cats and we can look at books and we can watch films. But why don't our government just stop taking things from nature mm -hmm. to entertain them? This would be a tremendous step forward in which kids around the world could, could be part of in a really exciting wave of expression, popular expression. Sounds like some good ideas for, for that work. 
What about college students? So I am a faculty member at Aquinas College. I've got lots of young people who are interested in going out and, and changing the world, making a difference in the world. What would be your advice to them? Well, individuals can change the world, um, but it's, it's not easy to find the opportunity. Um, but as long as you, you feel that there may be an opportunity, and as long as you feel positive about looking for that opportunity and using whatever you do towards that opportunity, I think you can, you can do better than simply saying the place is a mess and there's nothing I can do and so I'll switch on my, my, um, my device and <laughs> disappear into some make-believe world. I mean, I think we have a responsibility. I think it's very unfortunate the way we're not giving the young, young people real access to opportunity. Hmm. But by pressuring their leaders, by pressuring their society, college kids can do a lot. Um, and if we were to say to everybody, write to your, your represent, representative and ask them to join the movement to stop any trade in elephant ivory, or to urge the government of the United States to stop any, any activities that encourage the trade in wildlife species, then every student could not only do it him or herself, but could rope in five or six of their friends in, in the so-called viral network. This could be very, very powerful and would be heard in every capital of the world. We keep coming back to the, the idea of social media and it it uh, takes me back to 1989 when you made uh, a splash in the media. Couldn't, couldn't buy advertising for what you did with um, the burning of the ivory. Would you do that again uh, without social media? Would, would you make that kind of statement in that way? Was it effective, do you believe, in, in helping you accomplish your goals? The burning of the ivory was effective mm -hmm. in 1989 because it was so unexpected mm -hmm. and uh, nobody had ever thought that ivory was valueless. Mm -hmm. And by burning so much ivory, people started to ask mm -hmm. the question. And yes, it was hugely effective. And it, it, I suppose the best measure of how effective it was is the price of ivory up to that moment. And the ivory I burned had just been bid for in an auction, mm -hmm. was selling at 150 US dollars a pound. And three months later, you mm -hmm. couldn't uh, find ivory that was valued higher than $5 a pound. And at that very low value, the temptation to illegally kill elephant uh, was greatly changed, uh, particularly as the uh, policing of the elephant was better. And you're not going to run a risk of being arrested or shot for $5 mm -hmm. a pound. Mm -hmm. um, but that sort of publicity went, went completely mad, and there was no social media at that time. Yeah. It was just newspapers, radio, television, and, and magazines. Mm. It's been estimated it went out to several billion people in the first year. Mm. And it wasn't so much that people read between the lines, but they heard about elephants and realized there was a crisis. Mm. I think if you did it again today, you'd have to be very careful that it wasn't a gimmick. Mm. There are moves afoot to, to buy up ivory that is held by governments in Africa to then destroy it. And I'm pleading with the organizers of this campaign, don't buy it because you give it value. Mm -hmm. Persuade the governments who hold it that it's valueless. Destroy it. The way we destroy valuable cocaine, mm -hmm. valuable drugs. We don't confiscate it and then sell it around the other side, or we shouldn't do. We shouldn't do that with, with ivory either. We should simply say it is a valueless commodity. It's a stupid trade. We don't want it and destroy it. That would get the attention not only of the media again, but the attention of, of, of the social media buffs around the world. And that would be very powerful. One of the other things that you did during your administration was um, with the Kenyan Wildlife Service was to really rethink or, or put a new package around ecotourism. Is ecotourism a solution for us? Ecotourism is a, is a mm -hmm. I don't know if the audience understand the word, but it's an oxymoron. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the best e ecology is 
absolutely untampered with by humans. And if you mm -hmm. tramp humans through, no matter what you do, you're interfering with nature. But realistically, uh, it is necessary to have tourism. And I think the, the idea of record tourism is that you should strive hard to have the least impact mm. in maximizing the benefit and enjoyment of natural spaces. It can be done, but perhaps not the way we've done it in many places, but we can improve on that. And there's no doubt that the, the attraction of, of nature and the value of nature mm. as a, a social benefit needs to continue to be uh, talked about and talked up. Mm -hmm. One more question, and, and this is um, not that you're that old, <laughs> but what legacy do you hope will be yours uh, for the time that you've spent on Earth? I'm not sure, it's because I'm not old, um, <laughs> but I never really thought of a legacy. Um, I think the thing that gives me most comfort when I finally go to sleep at night is to think that I've, I've done my best whatever I've done that day and that I haven't um, shirked opportunities that arose um, because it was inconvenient to do something. Um, I would like to be thought of as a man who, who tried his best to meet the challenge of making the world a better place. Wonderful. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.